I made sure I went to the post office my call and on because here in the capital we don't have them. Right. Yeah. Not yet. We are getting one though. Um, you heard. But so we're live. Um good morning. Today is Monday. Um the eyes of April. <laughs> and oh, this is a meeting the Senate Natural Resources and Energy. I want to thank everyone the committee and others for coming in on, on Monday. We have um we're in the midst of combining, as people know, uh, three bills, uh, primarily 311 and 687. I think 308 lives on in different forms in, in both those bills. Um, one of the things that came over from the House in 687 was, I think, offered as a floor amendment, and it included, so we haven't been talking about it, we haven't really seen it much before, but it's accessory on farm businesses, although we we do have a bill on it. We've had a couple of conversations. Um, so wanted to have a chance to just have um, the government and Collier give us a three-minute overview of where they suggest we're at on the issue, what 687 suggests, and then I wanted to talk to the committee and see where it's on. on it. And I'll not to be mysterious, but today. So my experience with this since 2007, off and on, has been that uh, you can end up going down some rabbit holes on the issue, and uh, it's often not quite as simple as we need, as first meets the eye. So that um, because we have other issues to solve, my proposal to the thing will be, one, just reorient ourselves to the issue now, and then um, remove it from our bill and then in the five, six, seven, eight, nine days between here and the through the money committees and the floor, commit to hearing more testimony on it um, and seeing if we can come bring an amendment to the floor to address it. Um, or at the very least, it's in 687. So when we get to the of conference time, which is probably a week or so beyond that, we'll have had even more time to work on the issue and be prepared who's all there, but uh, I don't want to dismiss it in any way, but I'm feeling actually if the housing piece is um, has to take precedence on it. So I don't know if that feels like an okay path for the committee, but still, just to help us know from your point of view where we're at, if you could sort of make a pitch for what the house has sent us and how you feel like it's, uh, Addresses the issues you've heard talking about off and on just a little bit in the last three, four days of the committee. So, Mr. Collier, Mr. Grover, do you want to introduce yourselves for the record and talk uh, a little bit sure. about it? I'm John Grover, and I'm the policy and work program director for Vermont Natural Resources Council. And good morning, and thank you for that introduction, Mr. Chair. I'm Steve Collier from the Agency of Agriculture and Food and Markets on the General Council for the Agency. Thank you both for coming. Sure, and I think John, maybe, maybe I'll go first. Yeah, and then I'll, I'll jump in and provide our perspective and work on it. This, this is actually a very simple issue, but it's hard to explain it in three minutes or five minutes. So even though at its core, it's quite simple. So if I might, I just want to give you a, a broad basis for why we think it's so important. And it all comes back to Act 250 and farming and what Act 250 was designed to do, which is in part to make sure that we continue to have farms in Vermont. As I understand it from Governor Hoff's report, when he was on the first Act 250 commission, the state was very concerned about the loss of farming. Lands. At that time, when the report was, was actually issued, there were about 43% of Vermont was in farmland. And they were petrified because it had been 80% about 50 years earlier. So there was already a long trend of losing farms. There had been about 27,000 farms 50 years earlier, and now they were down in 1964 to 9,000 farms. And by the time Act 250 was adopted in 1970, there were about 4,000 farms. So there was this real concern that people were going to come in and buy the land. There was more access with, uh, with highways. There was more ability to convert farmland to other uses, and so there was a concern, and that's in large part, as I understand, why Act 250 was developed. So since that time, at that time, we had about 420,000 people in the state. We now have a 50% greater population, approximately, than we did at the time. We have about 72% less farmland. 
than what we did when 250 was passed. So this precipitous decline going from 43% farmland to in the 2016 analysis, 12% farmland, and that number varies somewhat depending on what exactly you're looking at. But whether it's a 50% or 72% drop in farmland over the last 50 years, that's precipitous. And, 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 it's, and it's continued. It's actually probably more alarming now. It's been a long time. Just since COVID, since January of 2020, I don't know if you all know, but dairy is by far the biggest, I'm sure you know this, is the biggest agricultural industry in the Vermont. And it accounts for about 70% of agricultural revenue and about 80% of the farmland. We've lost 25% of our dairy farms since COVID, 25%. But we have more camps. No, we have fewer cows. Wait, since COVID. Yeah. We have fewer cows. Our production has gone down, not, not significantly. Yeah. But a large part of what this whole bill is to do is to preserve a small farm. Larger farms that have resources can, and this is, let, let me just finish this a bit if I can, and I'll talk a little bit about, about what the bill tries to do. But 25% of our farm loss in the last five, in four years, four years of our, of our farm that produced most of our revenue. Not only that, but in the last five years, so every five years, USDA, um, NAS, it's called National, uh, uh, so, uh, National Statistic, Na National Agricultural Statistics Service produces a survey, a, a census. And just since 2017, so the last the last census number is 2022, they were just published, we've lost 4% of our farms um, in Vermont. And that's all farms. That includes everybody who produces $1,000 or more. So those are tiny little places. We only have 6,500 farms in the state. And that's that being that inclusive. We've lost 300 of those farms in the last five years. Even more concerningly, we've lost 11% of our harvested cropland in five years. So we lose a quarter of our dairy farms, 11% of our farmland, and 4% of our overall, overall farms in the last four to five years. Something has to change. Do we need a question about farm yeah. land? Eleven percent of harvested land is it been converted or it's just not being actively plowed? It's not being actively harvested. We don't have the statistics about what happens with that land. These are USDA compiling information from the could be fallow, could be a house. Exactly. Okay. It's no longer being harvested. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Could be developed, could be forest. Could, be developed. could we don't know? We know what happens to some of the land, but a lot of it can come down. So back to the proposal, and I'll be try to be brief, is that right now a, a farm can is exempt from Act 250. First of all, when farming was has always been exempt from Act 250, but when farming was first defined in Act 250, farming wasn't even defined. It was just farming. If you were farming, you were exempt. There was no definition of what farming meant. It wasn't until 1985 when there was a definition of farming that was adopted, when the infamous principally produced standard was first adopted. And what that says is if you store, sell, prepare, or sell agricultural products that you principally produce on the farm, you are exempt. I do not know what the General Assembly meant when they passed that language, principally produced. Arguably, it just means a majority of your products. It could, it could be as long as a majority of the things you sell, you produce, are yours, then you're exempt. <laughs> The problem, and if that was the case, we probably wouldn't need to be here because that, that would probably be okay. But the reality is, is the only way to interpret and to enforce it is product by product. There's no way to compare bread to apple cider, to carrots, to blueberry smoothies in a meaningful way. So if you actually want to apply and define principally produced, you really have to look at what product you're talking about. It's pretty easy to determine if you're principally producing cider. It's not easily easy to determine if you're principally producing 16 different agricultural commodities that all have different proportions of ingredients that, that are created on the farm. So that principally produced standard has been very difficult because if you're an apple orchard, you can sell apples, you can make cider, you can make a big processing plant on your farm to make cider, as long as most of the apples are yours. You can buy your neighbor's apples and make them into cider. But if you only grow apples, you can't buy your neighbor's pears and you can't sell your neighbor's pears. And you can't put, you might be able to put the pears into an apple pear juice as long as the majority of the ingredients are still yours, but you couldn't use your same processing setup to make pear juice because you didn't principally produce the pear juice. We think, and we work with the, the NRC and the NRB and many other stakeholders, that it's really important for farms to be able to work together to sell the agricultural products that they produce and make. And then requiring each farm to do it all on its own 
is too much to ask. It's, and it's not efficient. If one farm stand has a terrific location on Route 7 or on any major work route, and it's just a great place to sell products, it makes a lot of sense to combine those products in one place and be able to sell them together. That's all we're asking to do is to allow farms to be able to sell each other's products. And because of the, so that's, so the accessory on farm business was created in part in response to the difficulty of principally produced. And the only thing accessory on farm business changes when it comes to agricultural products is it uses a, is use a revenue threshold instead of a product threshold. And what I mean by that, instead of having to principally produce each product, you have to produce a majority of your annual revenue on the farm. So that means if you are if you are the apple orchard and you want to sell your neighbor's pears or incorporate them in your product, you can do that as long as a majority of the product comes from your own farm. The problem, accessory on farm business works pretty well, but it's a municipal law. It doesn't extend to Act 250. So what that means is currently we have farms navigating two different conflicting standards for two different uses under municipal law and under Act 250, plus they have to follow all of our regulations, which is a whole separate thing, series of issues. So what we're trying to do is make it more meaningful for farms, easier to interpret for the folks who enforce, easier for farms to implement, and really it's just to allow farms to sell each other food. So everyone seemed to agree that farmers selling each other's food is a good thing. Some people, how see any in particular, had a concern about a farm small farm opening up a huge processing plant and not there not being any scope scale exposure. So we built in, so right now the proposed language next H687 is a farm under the way that it's proposed can sell, as long as they're a real farm, they're, so, they're, they're producing their own products, they can sell anybody else's products. But to process them, they can, uh, there's still that majority revenue threshold. So the way that it's set up right now in H687 is if you want to process food on your farm, which you can already do if you principally produce it, but under this standard, if you want to be able to do that, you have to grow a majority of the sales yourself. So it still creates flexibility, so you can you can buy your neighbor's pears and you can process them, but it still requires you to grow a majority of the annual revenue yourself. So there's still a scope scale parameter check, just like principally produced, probably what principally produced was originally intended to mean but it enables those farms to work together. And the supply chain is such an issue in Vermont. Farms don't have the capacity to do it all their own. So to enable them to, to buy and sell together and to be able to work together to create a viable farm stand instead of having to try and have 20 different ones is the whole goal. And we think the scope scale requirement really keeps it in check. So if you sell $2,000 of carrots, you're not gonna open a big processing plant, can't do it. You could buy nine, $1,900 of blueberries and, and process those, but, and if you do that, great. But that, so that's the, that's the pitch. We really appreciate all of the work, that, all of the support from the BNRC and the NRB. Everyone seems to understand, or at least the people we're talking to seems to understand that the decline in farms and farmland in Vermont is a serious challenge. And this is something we can do to help them that doesn't actually cost any money. It's not, we're not asking for them, to, we're asking to enable them and help themselves. We're not asking for, for them to get money or asking them to be able to do what they, what they don't even want to do, they just want to grow food. But because they can't survive doing that, we need to allow them to be able to have some more tools and we pull about it. So that's a quick pitch. I'd love to talk a lot more about it. Yeah, and I'll just say really quickly because I know the time is short. They, this was, so Senator Bray uh, mentioned the, study, not this summer, but the summer before that the NRB conducted. And there was a review of this whole regulatory scheme. And I could say as a former regu regulator, I certainly recognize that this whole principally, principally produced, the way we regulate is very complicated and difficult to enforce and administer. But we, you know, it's hard to get agreement about there's many facets to this, the facet that Steve just talked about, but then there's farms that are doing like wedding barns and doing like other um, events, and that's not part of this proposal. And the NRB study, they couldn't reach consensus on how to deal with that because there are really different impacts and different issues around that. But the one issue we agreed on in the NRB study was everything that Steve said, farms should be able to sell and use other farm goods in you know, their farm stands and their processing, as Steve um, described. And we worked, and it's just tricky because the scheme is so complicated. We worked and we worked this language and the language got worked over in the house to try to deal with unintended consequences and some of the 
sort of around the whole hypothetical that the chair mentioned. So we've tried to address those, but you should look at the language and, you know, obviously for yourself, analyze it, but that's what we try to do. We think this is a reasonable step to take consistent with the NRB recommendation. And then I think further conversations need to be had about the whole principally produced way that we regulate um, in this in this area. But that this is a fairly narrow, in our view, you know, change. Um, Sarah, what can Sarah like Uh Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you both for coming in for reaching consensus on, on this topic. Um, I'm happy to support language that does as you describe it. Um, I think my main concern has been and you pointed it out, Mr. Grobman, the large event space. That is the, you know, it's more of like a, it, it almost feels like a Hollywood set version of a farm where they're selling merch. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, you can maybe see a sheep in the distance kind of thing. Um, I don't, that doesn't feel like the direction I think Vermont should go to make our main revenues in tourism when we need huh. resilient food yes. systems. So that's my main concern is how do we make sure that we're not incentivizing that type of potentially lucrative and stabilizing business model at the detriment of our food systems. Um, so I'm happy to support the language if it does as you describe it. Um, but I, I had one question and then a concern. Um, my first question is, it gets thrown around a lot that we have way fewer cows or way, as you put, fewer acres of farmland being used, it's decreasing. But then I also hear we're producing the same amount or we're producing more of any of these goods. So I'm wondering if you could speak to that. Have we lowered the amount of production or are we actually doing something good where we're being more efficient with our use of land? So I think there's some of both. I think farmers are definitely more, much more efficient. And, and just to put it out there, we have much better statistics on dairy farms than we do on most other kinds of farms because mm -hmm. we license every activity of what they do. Whereas if you if you sell vegetables, we, we get information from USDA. We may be there as part of our produce regulatory program, but we don't have the same sort of data that we have for many farms that we do for dairy. So and but dairy has this, you know, 70% of the agricultural revenue. It's an important sector. And and definitely dairy farms have become more efficient. Yeah. Definitely dairy farms are producing far more milk yeah. per cow. And I would say that's the success story yeah. of it. The, but and production has gone down. It was growing for, for years. It was, I think, at about 2.7 2. billion pounds not long ago. It's down to about 2.5 now. We did have, we, the cow numbers have gone down forever. And that is a good thing if you can produce enough. But that more intensive use of the land comes under a lot of scrutiny for environmental reasons, for water quality reasons. So a lot of people don't like that more intensive use of the land. You have another bill and that, that passed the House on neonic usage which is a prime example of that, where when you are using, when you are forced to compete in the national economy, international economy, and you're becoming more efficient, you have to adopt certain standards to make you competitive. So it's a push-pull. I mean, there is some success in that, but what my concern is, at what point do you no longer have enough capacity to sustain the necessary infrastructure? 486 dairy farms, it's not very many. And there were 4,000 in 19, you know, 1970. There are 486 now. There were 1,000 just not long ago. So, yeah. and the bigger issue is those farmers are getting older. There are not, there are not many younger farmers coming into it because they don't want to work 365 days a year um, every day. I mean, it seems sure. like it's very similar to what we've seen with the shift from small businesses to more like franchise or conglomerate businesses over time. So it seems like you're experiencing kind of nationally what we're saying. But okay, so my only other concern is, can I just say my concern? Well, and so then wrap up. We only have ACC did to 11. We were yeah. five. This is the AOMB poll. So, Senator McDonald, do you have a quick question? Then we'll, we will schedule time. I, I, and my name is the farm I live on now. They have more cows than people. Mm -hmm. um, I farm the land, and there are five cellar poles on the land I farmed. That was five different farms operated on the small farm that I, where I raised beef. And earlier in the testimony, there was, if you earn a majority of your income on the farm, that makes you a farmer. 
So I'm not a farmer. I, I, I think I, I was taking a narrow center, the principally produced, for you to principally produce, that's only one part of farming. Raising animals is also farming, but the principally produced is, is the products that you're making and selling. So in order for you to principally produce a product, you have to make a, you have to grow or raise a majority of it on the farm. So if you're raising animals, that's also farming. But if you wanted to open a, a bakery on your farm to make bread, unless you grew a majority of the wheat and other ingredients, you wouldn't be able to do that and be farming. So it's not, you don't have, it doesn't have to necessarily be a majority of your income, but the principal produce just one facet of farming. But it's a key here because that's the products that you can sell. Can I just ask my concern? Sure. Okay, the dormant commerce clause came yeah. up with bread. Did uh, you discuss that? Yes. Yeah, so, Is it resolved? Is it real? It's To me, it's a real issue that's easily fixed. And did you fix it in the language? I, I have a draft that's fixed, but I know it's going to need to be changed here. Okay. Thank you. It's a few words, Thanks. but yeah. I do think they're important. I have the same question on my team. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I okay. shared that language with John, and I think we're and for an agreement that it works. Well, part of what it ends up doing is it cuts a little bit against the whole story of, well, if this is a neighbor butting up with a neighbor, it's like, well, you can't just say that, right? You have to allow product in from, I could have Tasmanian pear coming in to add to my apple juice, right? And it's true. But that's so, everyone who principally produced as well. Sure, I just yeah. mean, sometimes the way things are pitched doesn't always reveal the nuances. Of yeah, I mean, that was the intent of that. House Act, they really wanted to make it Vermont, but yeah, there's the U.S. Constitution. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we do think it will be Vermont farms. I mean, these are small operations. The idea that you're going to import a lot of stuff from Texas or California is not, they, they can already do it, but they're principally produced and they're not. So I don't think that's a yes, it's a, it's a reality, but Commerce Clause does require that we treat out of state entities the same as we treat in state. For example. Sure. Okay. I just want to clarify, you said that the, the, the farmer or someone who gets the majority of their farm income from the farm, not the majority of their income from the farm. You, uh, income, I, I don't think income is relevant to whether you're farming. It's whether or not you're doing the well, That's what the problem is. Yeah, I'm a farmer. Well, it's can't make any money, but people have to do other things too. Yeah. Yeah. The difference between when we're talking about the definition of Principally produced for these regulatory programs. The definition of farmer is fair, is, is broad and right. It's very qualified to be a farmer. It's a low, it's a much lower bar. Many farmers have to work other jobs, but that doesn't determine whether or not you're farming on your land. It's just in order to sell something as a farmer, example, my 250, you have there are standards about how you do it. So thank you for giving us an intro. Uh if, there's a lot of interest in, in supporting uh, farming and keeping that, you know, all those ventures viable in the state. And I would say just our last 15 minutes, exemplify probably why we'll take it offline and come back to it. Um, just because the, the housing at 250 pieces are pressing so hard. Well, in the form of, you know, a 178-page committee report that, um, they get longer for Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Um, Mr. Cochran and Mr. Thank you for coming back. So um we were reading through last week mm -hmm. and we were finding things as um we wish we had ACCG at the table is yeah. to sort some of these things mm -hmm. out. Um uh, you know, I'm not sure quite how far back in 687 we want to go and work forward, or if you had a plan of attack for the 30 minutes. We have a plan of attack. Right? Oh. <laughs> how about that? Sure. What's the plan of attack? I'm going to suggest this on how this works. The invite that we got was please um, walk us through section 35 to 51. And we're prepared to do that. Okay. Um, Perfect. And a little bit more context. Um, we we have prepared testimony that we can share with you. Great. Um, and then we also have um, our general counsel is working on my edits um, that we'll be able to share. They should have context and additional information if there's you know, questions about changes. Most of them are 
there's duplicated language, the states would be better, they're more consistent. So they're not, they're more technical in nature. Yep. So today I think we want to focus on um, really the, the more substantive changes that are more policy decisions. Um, so we can think about them. I'm sorry we didn't know what the plan was today. I no, that was I that was the lost plan. the tie and knew that it was casual dress. But I really would have been excited about that. Uh, um, some of us just Oh, yeah, so. <laughs> um, but quickly, I think what was really missing, if, if you can indulge us really being fast, is just a little table set reminder of kind of why we're here and why the designation programs are part of this skill. Um, does that make sense? Okay. Yes. Um, Chris Hoffman, for the record, I'm joined by Jacob Bremer, Fund Policy Manager with the Department. Um, we have, um, just the background, we have five designation programs currently on the books. Um, they were created over 25 years ago with him fits and subs for different purposes and different reasons. Um, the program has worked. It's fairly successful, um, but um, most stakeholders complain that they're too complicated and we're not really meeting communities where they are. We're not providing them the simple resources uh, and pathways they need to achieve kind of the larger community revitalization and smart growth um, goals. Um, Despite that, the program is enormously successful. We have over 285 designations and uh, a large majority, almost 70% of all communities have a designation within them. Um, the pro program's goals historically are, are historic preservation, community revitalization, um, housing improvement, and how do we get more infrastructure into our centers to support growth and development. The major benefits of the designations are tax credits, your favorite senator at 250 permit relief, um, state grant priority, and technical assistance from the state um, to help people, uh, help communities achieve their goals. A couple of years ago, um, it was appropriated and a study was directed at ACCD to take a look at the designation programs. We hired um, two independent contractors, one a national firm called Smart Growth America, and one called Community Workshop out of Bethel. They did an independent review of our program. They engaged with over 500 different people. Um, where my numbers here, over 120 cities and towns engaged in this process. Um, we worked very hard over the summer to work with our partners who were doing concurrent studies. The NRB was doing studies. The RBCs were doing our studies. Uh, studies. They were all intended to come together into this moment that we are in right now. Um, where we are doing a better job aligning state level planning with infrastructure investments. So we're aligning um, the, our regulations and public investments into the places that we've identified for growth. Prior to them, Act 50 was an over 50 year old process. Didn't really have a direct linkage to our state designation programs that are a 25 year process. These two conversations, these various reports are coming together to integrate these pieces and have a more logical program in the state for how we support compact development within centers and conversely protect our, our working lands and forest areas from development. Um, the recommendations in the bill, the language in the bill, cues exactly to the recommendations that communities wanted. So it has gone through an extensive process. Um, the big picture, Jay, I'm going to pass to you. Can you do the yeah. A summary of kind of what's in the bill, and we'll do this quick, really, and then we can get to the section by section change. Okay. So, the proposed reforms in 687 maintain a strong focus on historic and commercial areas, and they are designed to simplify the programs by reducing the number of designation programs from five to two. Uh, so, the two designations under the proposed reforms are a center and a neighborhood with a separate coordinated track for regulatory recognition under the tier of Act 250 status. The key aim is to improve alignment with other state land use investments, efforts, and local and regional planning for non-regulatory investments and regulatory recognition. So this language offers um, also within it flexible steps for centers by recognizing that we have very small villages and very large downtowns so that there's a set process with uh, administrative approvals and um, and and it's uh, and and it's going to continue to be used in ways that save during historic buildings as well as adapt them for climate change. It, the, the reforms uh, both to expand technical assistance to meet communities where they are, 
And uh, just to get into a little bit more details about the two designation centers and neighborhoods, both would receive technical assistance support from the department and continue to advance high quality planning, meeting development goals and the designation incentives by planning grants would be there to support uh, community projects that help them achieve the uh, Act 250 tier one uh, status and support development and redevelopment ready places. The new designation boundaries are all designed to flow from the region plan maps and through the regional plan approval process. And so that enables recognition to downtown villages and neighborhoods for designation. And, and that meets the goal of making the program more accessible uh, and more equitable and more grounded in our local and regional planning process versus the state boundary making process. It's, and, and because it, we're moving that to local, uh, the proposal moves that to local and regional funding processes. It saves a lot of uh, um, time and resources and allows us to focus on technical service, doing what we do best, providing technical service, uh, great, uh, making grants. So in terms of the approval bodies, we would still have uh, a, a, an equivalent to the downtown board, renamed Community Investment Board in 687. And the designation of benefits would continue to be administered by the department and state board. Uh, the RPCs again would delineate areas for Act 250 relief that would go to the NRB and ERB approval and not the downtown board. So that's a key shift. Um, designations are flowing from the ERB process, but the benefits would be administered by uh, a community investment board, the reform downtown board. Um, and then there would be administrative approvals for certain uh, steps within the uh, two designations. The board composition is envisioned to be mostly stable with a focus on increasing coordinated public investments in the community. And, and there's a proposal to expand, expand membership and diversity in the board by having representatives from the Office of Racial Equity, the Treasurer's Office, and the Bond Bank. In terms of implementing this big transition from what we have now uh, to what's proposed, uh, um, the existing designations in the bill would best and benefits would not be lost. Uh, during the transition. And the transition period has different uh, model markers and the dates are included in the bill, but, uh, but there is um, a vesting period as long as eight years, which builds off the municipal planning cycle, so through 2030. It also establishes a structure and allows the HCD and other stakeholders to work on the details and guidelines, rulemaking, and if necessary, additional statutory updates in the next five years. Uh, the new designations uh, are geared to provide more benefits and technical assistance over time to better address climate change, housing, and rural capacity concerns. And it further directs the department to increase uh, interagency collaborations and investments by coming back to the legislature with the study and explore ways to expand technical assistance to help with local issues ranging from creating affordable housing, providing sidewalk investments, uh, water, wastewater, developing targeted area plans. Preparing for climate change. So, the work of the downtown board became a proxy for Act 250 exemptions because we could never find agreements on Act 250 reform. So, this is, gets the downtown board into the business of supporting communities with technical assistance and funding. I think we all know this, uh, the work done in individual committees is always good, but it all, often runs in tension with work with other committees. Our goal is to be able to help align these programs and projects by working with our sister agencies. So, um, as, and I think by getting us out of this business of doing regulatory reviews, we'll have a lot more time to do this. Um, a quick sort of longer term picture. <laughs> so, if we, for instance, have tier 1A uh, maps defined, et cetera, et cetera, um, do you, is it your sense that? People have relied on the designations now as a way of facilitating how they are the designated downtown, therefore you can your PHP or it was uncapped, stuff like that. So we came up with like a regulatory gateway. Longer term, when we have tier 1A, well defined, et cetera, do you, um, what's the, you have that sort of a gatekeeper role in terms of access to exemptions right now. Mm -hmm. Um, are you anticipating that will go away yes. and what will entirely be focused on is sort of your core work, whether something exempt or uh, uh, or treated differently under 
the law will all fall to the, the designations that come out like here in one A and So yes, um, we are getting out of the business of regulatory review and permit reviews. We are getting into the business of supporting community investments, uh, aligning interagency policies, and making it easier for our communities to grow in the way they to grow. Um, there is, uh, you know, we have a huge pool of stakeholders, designated communities that do not want to lose any of these benefits. So their benefits are going to best. They're not going to lose anything in this transition, but there is a transition that will take time. Um, but I think we've thought through the process carefully. Um, there is a pathway for them to seek the exemptions that they have, but that won't be through the downtown board. It'll through, be through the NRB DRB process, tier one. And then, then the designations and the tiers will be compatible because they're both voted from the same regional plans. Yeah. Thank you. So all these disparate elements trying to coordinate um, um, are actually being pulled together in one meaningful. So I'm gonna there are more questions, and then we can just go through the line by line. I've also submitted these comments, so June has all these online. Um, and I think we can probably get through our comments on the existing language in the bill pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Let's do that while then we may reach out to you to ask for follow-up. So, yeah, that's fine. I think, um, do we tomorrow? Are you available? I think I have time. Okay, so. I'll get to that at the end. Um, so before we even get into this bill, I wanted to mention um, S311. Um, we do support the temporary exemptions um, that are proposed in there. I do think um, we do have a housing crisis. Um, our communities are looking to find solutions for housing. And if there's a way we can support them, we continue by increasing the number of allowed exemptions and the duration. Um, I think that is a good choice. Um, the other thing I just want to flag, as I think is proposed in S311, um, it's more general. I think um, I don't want to through the exemption process. I don't want to see new buildings be allowed in flood hazard areas. So I want to just flag that you know, yes, it'd be allowed, but make sure they're not being rebuilt in areas per se. Um, as far as the section by section, um, this is going to be pretty quick and using famous. Um, um, I'm going to start at section 35, which is um, there's an affordable housing study. We worked with um, VHFA and VHCB and Land Access Opportunity Board to draft this language. The concern is, um, you know, priority housing projects have been a useful tool to the affordable housing community. And in some instances, if, if there is no Act 250, what, what are, what's the replacement incentive? Um, well, I think priority housing projects will continue in the tier um, tier two or tier tier one B. I'm sorry, really long piece. They'll continue there, but how do we ensure that affordability and affordable housing continues in our in our centers? So this is a report that we worked on together um, as far as drafting the language, um, and we support that. Um, Section thirty six is makes updates and technical changes to. Uh, municipal planning goals, regional municipal planning goals, we support that. Um, section 37, it's related to duties of regional planning commissions, we support those changes. Section 38, it's climate resilience mitigation and adaption to regional plans. As I have just met in on the section 37, so it's duties of regional planning commissions. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I highlighted was the environmental justice cross references that are new. Um, I'm going to say cross references, but like but we're expanding the way we think of mm -hmm. um, our, Is that already happening in your department? So you feel like this is a it's a certain it's a transition that we're already engaged in and the natural fit the way they're flowing in. I think it's a transition that we're all working hard to engage in, but it's you know taking many years to get where we are and how we unwind it um, takes a while, uh, but this cross-reference will ensure that we're making more meaningful statutory progress on this. Thank you. Um, section 30, oh, I'm sorry, section 39, it updates the process uh, for adoption of regional plan, uh, including notice and public engagement and engagement with municipalities. 
Um, we support it with changes, um, and we weren't involved in this conversation, and you know, this is a policy decision, but um, there's a provision in there <clears throat> related to objections of interested parties. Um, from our experience and most everywhere else in statute, the planning process is where you deal with objections and differences, and you don't have objections and differences being raised at the very end. Um, it's non-standard. There may be a good reason for that, um, but it struck us as different, that you go through this whole process where you're trying to get everybody bought into it, and at the very end, you have somebody who can raise objections. They do have to be involved in the process to raise the objection, but it just struck us as a, as a potential stumbling block that could delay approval. Okay, and just because we're this on page 79 yeah. and 80, and it's I, little I, objections of interested parties. Um, they may merit further discussion. Um, again, we were not involved in the conversation. Our RTC colleagues are affected by this. Our municipalities are affected by this. We may want to hear from them. Okay. So, do you have a recommendation? Sorry. <laughs> how would how would people? You should gauge up front. You know the whole intent of of all of these conversations is right now, the frustration we have with the regulatory program is people do not participate in the planning process. They have to in this. They have to. But right now what people do is they they litigate and they appeal permits at the very end. They don't get involved in the front end of the process. So we want to move, we want to elevate the planning process and make it more meaningful and have people engage in the front end. Um, well, you know, I think there's something that we're cutting against, and that's human nature. For instance, this weekend, I received five letters uh, from, I'm not teasing at anyone, I appreciate the input, five letters from the lawyers and a phone yeah. call, all on the cusp of getting ready to vote. So there is some sort of natural tendency where as something meaningful is about to happen, and it focuses attention and then people show up. And I don't... I, you know, I guess we write if we write rules that will steer us away from that kind of eleven hour. Um, well, the way the language is written, if I recall correctly, you have to be engaged in the process to be able to raise an objection at the very end. So these eleventh hour appeals, like, oh my God, this is happening, we need to stop it. Right? You don't have any standing unless you participate in the process. It just strikes me like we want to build a consensus, we want to hear everybody yes, but no, you have this final avenue to raise an objection. It may be fine. It just struck us nowhere else in law in the planning statutes is this kind of additional check provided and it was just struck us as anomalous. Sure. Do what you want. I'm just fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm on. not picking on anyone. I'm just saying like yeah. there's a human nature thing that is a little tricky. Uh all right, I'm worried. All right. All right. Um section 40. Um we support this section with some changes. Um, um there's the tradition of the downtown village center program is not historic preservation. It's um, it's it's the spirit of the program, and it's also recognizing the fact that we don't have a bunch of extra resources to support new development. Um, so we want a clarification, and again, we will send you this language that designated centers must be historic. Um, on just so I don't forget to ask, when will we see look? Moments from now. <laughs> Today, <laughs> yes. Okay. Our general counsel, um, we reviewed these. He's just giving them a final look. So we'll have line edits and context on all of these changes. Great. That should be helpful. But if you have additional questions, we can't come back tomorrow to explain. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, so we'll we send them to the committee. Absolutely. To Ms. Newman and Mr. Counsel. Thank you. Um, under C villages on page 90, this is a question. We were not involved in this conversation, but there's there's a provision for adequate soils. And I believe the intent behind this was to make sure that every community could achieve this designation. But I think it's a question for A&R about how to do this. I don't know how we can map an area because we don't have maps of adequate soils in the merit for development. Usually soils are determined on a permit by permit basis, whether and looking at your neighboring properties, is there a wellhead? Is there all these other things? Um, so just, a question about that, it's not our area of expertise, but I don't know how you map them, and I would encourage you to consult with AR to see if this language is workable as proposed. Um, 
under D, page 91. Can we, we back up to something? Uh, lines 20, 21, page 19. New commercial strip auto oriented development is now allowed to prevent negatively impacting economic vitality. Um, what was the plain spoken intention of that language from your point of view? Um, I'm going, I don't have the bill in front of me, but yeah, the intent was we're, we're not going to support investments in sprawl. We will help communities who want to repair their sprawl with regulatory relief. <clears throat> So you just the I have You said page nine to We yeah, but this was a very prosaic question. You said auto oriented. Did it mean automobile yeah. Yes. oriented? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But, but not auto dealers. No. Well, they're all kind of related. <laughs> but but no, the intention was we want walkable, bikeable, compact moves. Um, we don't want to support um small strip development. <clears throat> My understanding, auto referring to the whole post World War II style of building, mm -hmm. everything's Robert Moses. Mm -hmm. Yes, but these are areas of great opportunity because they do have roads and infrastructure and sewer and water, and we see parts of the state, you know, retrofitting them and uh, with housing. Um, and infrastructure is usually one of the biggest costs to making housing affordable. So we definitely want to support community's efforts to transition these areas from only car oriented to allow other moves <clears throat> and making them more concerned. Um G page 91, transition and infill areas. Um we recommend striking the word land. Um uh, oh, sorry, I don't have the. I didn't grab the bill when I left this morning. But well, it's economic viability for particular areas to be adjacent or nearby between grants or the wheelchair area. Is that the plan? Your size. Yeah, so our suggestion here is that in the transition or infill areas focus on the existing transition areas um, and not planning for new transition areas. Otherwise, the revenue. Sorry, page 90, line 15. Okay. An existing rather than right. planned or future ordinance. And, okay. and focus on the plan, uh, areas planned for development uh, in the planned growth area of body. Um, that, that apply to just. Um, okay, so these are these uh, these areas include areas of existing or planned commercial uh, office mixed use mixed use development or residential uses either of these two or planned growth areas. You want to strike that plan as well, like planned growth or village areas. Yeah, just the first. Just, just the first. Because mm -hmm. oh, I was I was thinking like planned growth okay. is like that's something else. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, and then the future land use notes on, um, and it says C. Uh, so, sorry, there's a yeah. third instance of plans yeah. in that sentence. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. so, planned growth is a defined term, but on page 91, line two and three. Right. So, yeah. So, planned for future growth. Mm -hmm. This area can also include adjacent to the field and safer from flooding and planning mm -hmm. for future growth. We we want to be able to support a community that needs to grow in this, you know, recognizing these areas, but the, the limits on our benefits, we don't want to see that the designations go to that. So we strike that sentence as well. Are they not? They're not not different Keep it. Right, so how about Let's go oh, look at your sign. They got something. Yeah. You'll, have, you'll have it. You'll have it marked up. Yeah. Okay, we'll watch this for that. See how you put it out. Um, reconsideration. Thank you. Um, these, I think most of these are pretty quickly. Um, future land use maps, there's a, a date change. Um, right now it's July 1, 2024. 
We recommend moving that to December 31st, 2025. This is one year before the actual plans. Um, again, this is all going to be on markup. Um, the Regional Planning Commission study, um, we are named as a participant and we support that. Um, the appropriation for uh, fish and wildlife is a new position. I, I don't know the history on that issue. You consult with the um, The additional um, monies for the period of um, municipal and regional planning and resilience funds, um, this was not in the government's budget, so we oppose that. However, if you do you choose to keep it? Um, we recommend making some changes to the programs to ensure that it aligns with the existing program. The changes that were offered in your bill were floor amendments. We were not consulted in them. Um, if they're adopted as they are, we have to basically create a standalone another program. We'd much rather keep them consistent. Um, we'd also recommend splitting. Um, I think it's a $1.5 million appropriation. We recommend 600,000 go to municipalities, and then the balance 900,000 go to the regional planning commissions to support their climate adaption work. Again, this is all marked up. <clears throat> okay, so that although you're opposing, are you provided reference to this? If you were to do, do this, here is how we would recommend This is how you would do it in a way that wouldn't cause. Chaos, right? <laughs> um, um, section 45 appropriates monies for two positions, one at ANR and one at CCD. Again, these were not in the governor's budget, so we propose those to achieve spending <laughs> items and positions. Would it be? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Do you think you can accomplish the work that's being done in here at the current staffing levels? I. <laughs> um, I don't know. It depends what the bill, what the final bill looks like. But I'll... if we were to two scenarios, one we do all of your changes, one we don't. Does that impact? Yes, that's for additional reforms. <laughs> and and you feel that in either scenario, the staffing levels are adequate now. Um, Staffing's always, we could always do more with more, <clears throat> but again, this is not in the government budget, so we, this opposition was to oppose me. These additional provisions. Okay. Um, if we were to ask to do the work. Yeah, like that's kind of what I'm trying to do. Then would you feel as though in order to do that work, you would think you would need more we, <laughs> we're we're wait points. <laughs> I, I have to tell party line, but it's not in your budget. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's uh our our regular and schedule ahead of a pending one day. Got it. Off we go. Um thank you. <laughs> um on to section 46. Um, the repeal of 76A, um, this is where the existing designation programs live. Um, there's a new section where the revised sections or the revised program is going to live. Um, we want to make sure and be really careful that in this transition, no benefits are lost. And we're going to provide additional language just to make sure that is clear that that transition, when it occurs, as far as the dates, and that no benefits are lost during this transition. Um, Section 47 creates a new chapter 139, which is replacing 76A. Um, we recommend um, including the language for it's kind of the, the purpose language um, for 76A, um, because there's a lot of interpretation that we'll need to do in, in developing guidance and rulemaking. And in reviewing, it's actually really good and really, really helpful in forming future policy discussion. So, in support of your goal of getting a 200 page bill, we're going to recommend including the purpose and intent section from 76A into this new section. Um, state um, 13, um, state designated downtown and village center, just an additional clarification to add these areas on historic. This is a special favor for me. Um, we do a lot of hustling with our external partners to raise money, to do projects, programs, and 
you kind of created things, um, but we have no provision really to accept funds mm -hmm. um, from our partners. So there's special purpose language to allow the department to accept money from outside entities to support special initiatives. I don't know if it's in the right place in the bill, but it's that's language that will allow us to take these monies. There's additional line edits um, to clear up um, redundancies, um, language cleanups, and also um, it makes several date changes to ensure that we can implement the program consistent with other sections of the bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Section 47, I need a lot of what is going on here in general. So you haven't even gotten to the part that's confusing to me, but this is the section that I most, I don't know. So, so, but before we, so I just want to flag that for you that I maybe we'll have more questions. Sure. And I'd love for you to explain it. Um, but could you just give an example of where the government would need to accept private funds to support these initiatives? Sure. So a couple of weeks ago, a month ago, we did this um, Homes for All initiative in Derry, which was talking about how do we revive missing middle housing, a lost housing type in Vermont. Um, we worked with a bunch of external partners um, to support the event. Who, what's it, who's an example? Um, the Vermont Bankers Association, oh. BHCB, um, the BNRC, realtors, okay. other parties who are supporting our work, who wanted to make a contribution to support this event to help us make the lunch and the event free. Um, we were hand, our hands were a little tied because we couldn't accept these funds to support these events. Um, so there's an example. So it's small amounts of money. Yeah, this is not huge, but would you learned... be open to it being listed as a small amount of money? Absolutely. Yeah, I don't know what a small amount is, but we can probably come up with a number. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's just I have major concerns when we start to mm -hmm. offset public costs with private funds because I think it sets us up to then assume that either A, this is un unvaluable work or not valuable work for the government to be doing, or B, the private sector could be doing it better, um, or it's their job to do it. And I just want to avoid that. These so to, it seems like small. Fair point. Understood. These are, you know, the downtown conference is another thing we're having in Dallas oh. Falls. We get a lot of people who want to support the events, and we want, we want to be able to right. take their money and have them sponsor the event because that lowers costs. And be able to people to participate. And you don't think that it leads to any kind of favoritism? No, there's no express you know, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, Jacob, you had to fly away really soon. Um, we're almost there. Um, um, section 48, um, I manage the downtown village center tax credit program to allow it to be um, a little bit more helpful in mitigating distant flood. But wait, but just so I understand, you proposed section 47. Okay. ACD proposed section, section 47. 47 basically what, takes existing what does, language. What does it do? Why do you have it as steps? Because at this point, I would like to remove it from the bill because I do not understand. So if you wouldn't mind explaining why this is the process. And, I mean, I basically need to be pitched on this for me to want to keep it in the bill. And it seems like in all of the conversations we've had, you would be the individuals to pitch it to me. Yes, fair enough. So, so that I don't want to overstate so it, but section 47 is existing statutory language. It pulls over all the chapter 76A benefits that are, are granted to downtowns and village centers and all of our different areas and pulls them into this new new what is the um, new chapter one that we found. So there is not any new language in there. It was pulling existing programs into that we had to carry them forward because. We're deleting seven to six days, so they needed to live somewhere. The steps that we're proposing are what Mr. Hamlet was talking about. We need to meet communities where they are, and it proposes a ladder of benefits. Um, right now, villages have to do a little bit of footwork before they can become a, a village. As in the new framework, they will be automatically recognized, so they will be automatically qualified for, for, for tax credits, is what, what they usually want. Um, but we wanted to create a ladder of incentives to encourage people to take the next step. So do a little bit more work and you're going to unlock additional benefits. Downtowns are going to do a little bit more work and they're going to unlock additional benefits. So there's, and this is what we heard from communities is they wanted this stepped approach um, to kind of have a line of continuum for improving their program. As they did more work, they would unlock more benefits. Can you, I have multiple internal questions to this section. May I ask those? 
Um, I don't know how much volume you can do. You gotta be sending your wells. Well, how many about that? Oh, you have to step out. I'm worried about. Um. Well, it's just, I'll just say it's yeah. disappointing to have such a major proposal come forward without the individuals who proposed it having adequate time to explain it. So can I ask as many questions? Okay, it's just frustrating because I do want to understand this and I feel we have not had that exchange. Okay, so page 104, sprawl repair. What does that mean other than the definition that we've gotten here? So kind of like I was talking before, we have many auto-oriented places that have infrastructure, that have roads, sewer, and water, um, but are not currently walkable. They're not currently walkable. How can we recognize these areas and support them and transition them into more walkable, viable, pedestrian-oriented places? How can we lower the cost of housing by um, using that land in these areas Turning parking lots into housing opportunities. That is the intent of behind the word sprawl today. Okay, thank you. And do you have an it, It's just infill. In yeah. 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 yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't have other things. Okay, Main Street America. What are they? Thanks. Yeah, it's a, it's a national program that we are affiliated with, um, run from the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Um, the, the downtown program right now is currently a member of this organization that provides technical assistance and benefits to our designated downtown community. So our membership in that organization flows through to these communities. We have a listserv, they have resources, um, just anything that a downtown or village center would like to be able to um, improve their community has been done before, and this basically is a library of resources and people and expertise to help them do that. Okay, so it's not like a separate nonprofit. Why did you choose the term center? And are you open to changing the term center? Um, so you just say it well instead of yeah. so. Well, we use it many other ways. Yeah. So it might be simple to understand, but it actually has many other contexts that we use the word center. So you're, you proposed it because it's simple. Well, okay. and we have, you know, downtowns and village centers. We're trying to pull them together. And community centers seem to be, you know, it is a center. Um, and that seemed to be the easiest, most logical word. But if there's other words that have more currency or are less confusing, we're open to your suggestions. Or, or it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> well, it is defined. Um, I mean, there's sections, there's a whole definition section. <laughs> and it links back to the regional category of the downtown and building center. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's your recommendation. Okay. Um, why did you put this? Why did you benefit the way that you've done the steps? Why did you put each different benefit within each of those steps? So, why did step one have certain things, step two have certain things, and step three have certain things? What brought you? Was that all coming out of the work you did through the community engagement process? People pointed out, we want this step, we want this step, we want this step to hold these benefits. So the, the, the community engagement process really revealed that people wanted a uh, lower barrier and easier access to the program. Mm -hmm. um, and so what the regional mapping process would do, we're going to improve those areas automatically. No BS applies uh, okay. designation by designation. And then uh, and then within that center category, uh, it, there's a, a step one would be a lower barrier than exists right now. Mm -hmm. um, so it has fewer requirements and more benefits than, uh, let's say, a village center without a municipal uh, uh, plan or zoning could access right now. And then step two sort of maintains the a program that's similar to our village center designation, and step three is similar to the downtown designation. So it recognizes that there are different types of places, different levels of community capacity, and that communities need a ladder of uh, benefits to get to the to get to that next level and access more benefits. I understand that. Yeah. So why did you define this? What? How did you decide what benefits end up in what step? Just because it, it's more it relates to what the previous benefits were. So you didn't want to change those in any way, or felt that there were benefits that were there mm -hmm. Okay. So what? So now, if I'm a village center without a municipal planning and zoning, and I'm in step one, I get the same benefits. Yes or no? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. 
and and I think some additional benefits, but I think probably the easiest way to answer this question is to put the table. Uh, I would love a table. Yeah. Who would make that table? <clears throat> oh, we have to get a table. <laughs> we will provide you a table. Yes, because at this point, I, I, I'm trying to express that I, I need more information to feel confident. Um, okay. Page 115. Um, I just have a question mark around the historic preservation regulations. Um, what would be an example of a demonstrated commitment to protect and enhance historic character? Um, Other than the bylaws. It seems like that's in addition to bylaws. Like, what would an example be? So, yeah, you you have a historic preservation. Um, so, those are the bylaws that, that you know, we're investing in these communities with downtown and dirt and tax credits. We want to ensure that the community is using those benefits in a way that builds the overall community character. So, okay. they can think that. And this is currently a requirement of the downtown program. <clears throat> um, so, just having the bylaws, you're good. It doesn't need to be anything. Okay. Um, and then we had a whole conversation about um, tip districts and their relationship to the step process. I don't know if you wanted to comment on that. Yeah. Um, and why they're not included as a category one. So in the initial draft of the bill, there was a cross reference to the tip yes. citation. So the tip language still exists in a different Title Title Thirty Two, I imagine. Um, um, ways and means removed that cross reference, mm -hmm. um, but our opinion is it doesn't doesn't matter. The, the TIF program still points back to the designation for Yes. Yeah. So I I don't know, know what the intent was behind that. Oh, okay. That was it's, not a new suggestion. No. Okay. Okay. Um, I just want to do you mind if I just flip through mm -hmm. because I had a lot of things at this section that I since we have you, I'd like to just check. I don't have anything else on it. And I really appreciate you taking the time because sure. I. Well, I everybody's right looking, I'll, I'll keep one up. Just back on page 112, the yeah. Better Connections Program you. Yeah. So, you, you know, keep hunting. Um, I never want, but I thought while you're mm -hmm. looking, I would ask one of the same still. Um, better Connections Program, line 19, page 112. Can you just say what that pre existing program in the department is part of? This is an existing program, but it was a pilot program um, that supported community placemaking activities. It's been very, very successful. We are running out of money, um, um, but we, if, if the language removes the sunset, which allows us to continue to administer and close out the program as it is sincere. <laughs> So it's going to sunset, or you? Yeah, without legislative action, it will sunset. And also, in July. But you're recommending it continue. We're going to, just so we can continue. Um, you know, we have it takes a while for communities to close yeah. things down. Sure. Uh, we want to make sure that we have the statutory authority to close things down. But mm -hmm. personally, I'd like us to continue that program yeah. with at least a small amount of funding and better connections and better places. Two different, two different things. Yeah. I'd also like to see that for better places because my understanding is. And I may have gotten a yeah. perennial problem with mine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm talking about better places, which oh. is the place for people. Yeah. Better Connections is a program that we work in partnership with VTrans and ANR oh, okay. to improve bike pay connections, trail networks to downtown and village centers, et cetera. The uh, transportation bill codifies that um, and puts it into law this year. So it is going to be on the books. It was kind of an MOU until now. Um, okay. They need to pass that bill, but that will continue. But just for clarity, if we put in, we want money for better places and not to sunset it, you would be open to that recommendation. Yes. Um, I definitely support not sunsetting it, but additional funding um, is not on the governor's budget. So without it being getting additional funding, it would sunset. Yeah, well, there's still open grants that we do need to close out. Thank you. Uh, any more targets of interruption? Other things that you're seeing in this neighborhood you'd like to dig into? No, I mean, I, I think you've helped me understand more why the steps are set up the way they are. Um, it's a very big change. Absolutely. And I would hope to see a chart. Because what we will have to do if we pass this bill is explain to people why we voted for it. And <laughs> there are, is that. And so I'd like to be able to adequately explain. We'll get you a chart and table. I will say 
Um, part of the whole stakeholder engagement process was to make sure that we were giving you recommendations that would not blow up in your hands, that people supported and wanted. And I think the fact that you haven't heard from, you know, groundswell of communities complaining about these changes, what the department is doing, tells me that we are on the right track. Or they don't understand what the definition is called. Yeah, or they'll come in at the last minute. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> yes. yes. But only if they have standing. Yeah. <laughs> um, the last and final comment um, related to these are the tax credit sections. We support those changes. As we know, our communities, our, many of our communities are, are water adjacent and we need to make investments to ensure they can stand up and protect and, and weather the next one better than they have now. Um, there's really good policy language that the House passed. However, policy needs money to work, and there is language in S311 that increases the cap by $2 million. The program is oversubscribed now. We would really like to do more to help communities <laughs> be proactive and flood proof their buildings and reduce their future risks without more money to target them. And this was supported by the governor. So there's a stem. I can't support. <laughs> No, I just am excited. <laughs> An administrative supported flood policy. Okay. Um, any other questions as far as our ACC? Are you guys optional tomorrow? That's my question. Today. Today. So, I don't know if you have to. Our general counsel will send the committee the line amendments that we're recommending. I suspect there's probably going to be questions around them. So we'll be available tomorrow if you yeah. try to answer those questions. All right. And in addition to your edge, uh, the um, much sought chart is also coming over to something you already have. Uh, yes. Yeah. I think do we know that? I know yeah, it might be cleaned up a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Yeah. Public yeah. Public yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. I'm sorry we can't be here the whole day. We we saw we were on at 10, we assumed that that was the plan. So, um, thank you for your interest and support. Thank you, Peter. Well, um, yeah. Thanks again. Yeah. All right. Uh, with that, Mr. Kennedy. Thank you. Um, we talked about having a roadmap of sessions, and I don't know if I'm guessing yeah, there's not a uh, does anyone have, or does anyone need some fresh draft of the S311 uh, outline? That's my second outline. Or the 687 outline, which we need to support us because it's like there are extensive copies on hand in case anyone's. I think I have them, but I wouldn't mind another copy. There's so not the day. I have so many papers on the stuff. Yeah. So fresh. Thank you. Anyone else like a copy? Either or both? No. Do you want roadmap? Oh, what? They're the roadmaps of S311. No, I've got the other copy. Yes. Anyone else need one? No. But you can't make a roadmap. Yeah, now the sections are all different. And I'll do your favor and pass these to my right. Get one if you like, they're on our website. <clears throat> yes. Is that an angle? <laughs> well, I'll do your favor. You know what? I'll do a favor. I pass these to my right. I'm not saying my left. No, it's like that. Yeah, if you want to know, you can come on our website. Oh, I'm very Yeah, a little drinks. I love my Cassie at the Legislative Council. So what are we doing today? Yeah. So I think it's good that we had an ACC meeting here because I think that was the last section as part of last week's review that we had questions hanging. Um, and I thought that maybe one way to, to um, be steady about making progress was to pick up the well, we might have had some thought while you've been working on it, but my thought was we would um, pick up this bill, move as far forward as we did on Friday 
on the 687 review, which was something like a first 21 case. And then we could um, use our own markup copies of 687 and look at this instead of transposing things over and uh, formation edits. Eventually, we'll be shifting sort of out of 687 to 311. Um, and then I before we get into the mechanics of all that, so does that make sense to you and someone's going to manage all our words? Um, the other thing I thought about was, um, and this comes out of getting, you know, that I was referring to five letters talking, arguing both sides of the appeals process. Um, that one of the things, uh, I don't want us to be in the un unfortunate position of making decisions on things that are complicated, that we're not comfortable we sort it out adequately. And we actually don't need to decide yet on something. I mean, like it's it's years in the future. Um, so we won't be undermining the bill in any ways to, to say we don't know enough yet to make a final decision. So I'll be more plain spoken about it. I've been thinking about uh, the appeals process, and I, I know for myself, what I'm inclined to do, but I don't feel like I could uh, would want to make the argument definitively. Like, yes, we're doing exactly this. So, what I wanted to put on the table is to give us space to sort out what we can sort out now. If there's not a time, if we don't need to have made a final decision on something like how appeals will be handled post 2027, or whatever it is, or you can think of dates. Um, should we uh, structure the, our work and create um, I mean, a study group to say, we're going to get started on this. We're going to be moving forward. We will sort out the um, and I'll stick with the fields. Pros and cons of the two different approaches um, prior to needing to uh, make a decision, I would say, for the near term, no matter where we are going to go, there is a process in place that's going to operate for 30 years, um, take care of the power operating of the current law. So I'm just Putting that out there is an item for possible discussion. I'm thinking about like if we don't, if we're not well enough informed at the moment, that's what we do. And I don't see a downside to seeing providing space for further learning or making improvements, then um, wouldn't be putting off a decision for the sake of putting it off. That'd be, well, we'll be in a better position to make a decision because we'll have done more work. Um, implement the many other things going on in the bill. For instance, mapping the definition of peers, the establishing of a new professional board. There's a lot of work for years to come before you would ever start sending appeal to the new board versus making a definitive decision to say what the current we need not. So I'm um, floating that out there to give us some space to say we don't have to, I don't think we need to decide every single question that's in front of us um, between here and end of day tomorrow or Wednesday morning when we go. Because you can put your act to the next 50 years commission binder off your shelf. I read the chapter of that. I mm -hmm. know. Which was one of the recommendations from that commission. Yes. You had so, four or five. I, I get it. I'm I'm just saying. Uh, oh. Well, let me slow down and step back. The arguments for and against that came in various letters, we could we could dispatch with them and say we're 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 we made a decision, we're good to go. Or we might say, actually, there's, we still have some questions. And because it seemed like an important issue, 
I don't want us to make a decision that we <laughs> I don't feel like we've sorted through. Let me just, I'm not, I'm not, I'm only speaking for myself, but I kept visiting and revisiting over the weekend the whole issue. Um, one of the things that occurred to me was I didn't see a downside to providing time for further discussion that's been pulled up all the rest of the work. Other people may be feeling ready to go. Yeah. Are you soliciting feedback on that? Right. And there may be other things like that. Let me say, okay, there's many actors doing many things. Uh, are there things that we're feeling like we're rushing a decision in order to get sort of everything processed that's in this goal? Of time? Uh, and we wish we had more time, for instance, the whole accessory on farm business that you're spinning it off, saying, okay, we can work on that thing aside. This has to be in the school in the next two days. So, um, I'm wondering about um, the structure of these, of the conversation, the remainder of the day. Yeah. Um, I about appeals particularly. I mean, I have some thoughts as to sure. um, what we could do. I also don't mind making a decision and then saying, "There's there's time to change course." And so I guess I can. Uh, time is our friend in that way. Um, so, but uh, but I I allows us to be wrong potentially. Um, but I also, um, but in thinking about the the remainder of the day, yep. it feels like there are big topics that are going to need to be addressed specifically. And um, thinking about that, well, so you, so just to clarify, so you're you're hoping to just start going through the bill, and we'll get to the big topics as we get to the big topics. Yep. Or did you want to call out the big topics individually to have those conversations? No, I'm really only bringing this one forward because it's one of the more complicated things. And there's been a lot of back and forth. And I thought, okay, um, as a way of work, can we provide ourselves with um, a higher likelihood of yeah. getting our best work done to say, are there things that um, we can move a strong bill and not to make a final decision on? Yet, you know, yeah, and can we see the extent that it um, doesn't harm a bill? Then it's just an option available to us because people are feeling like, Well, I've thought enough about this, and I do want to see like it's definite. I want to, I want to decide, and I'm game for that too. I'm just saying, I'm just on the appeals. I feel like I have clarity about dates, I may not have clarity about what the right long term is. <laughs> um. Sure. <laughs> so is it coming down to you're not sure if we should go with an appeals process? Is it as in 687 or if we should have it go to the courts? Is that kind of the debate that you're well or is it something totally different? Uh it is there is gonna be a transit even if we made a decision, move everything to NRB or the yeah. national court. Um there'll be a transition period because that could be stood up for X number of years, right? Okay. Um, so if that is the case, and no one's actually going to be making, doing any particular work to get ready to hear appeal, um, we still need a, a way to cover appeals in the interim. And it could be during that interim period, you'd say, um, we just bought ourselves time to think slash rethink how those appeals will be handled. For instance, um, another proposal we haven't really discussed is it was here in the room <laughs> in some years past. Uh, would majors go to that uh, board from the get go? And then you only have a single round of appeals back from there, like you go right to the Supreme Court. You wouldn't have to start local, come up a level, uh, or go to ET and then to the Supreme So I just know there's other thinking in the background, and there's we haven't even had a chance to talk about some of those things. Do we want to provide ourselves with the opportunity to do so 
And you can say, oh, we can make a decision now and reconsider. Yeah. Um, so we can have that um, the dot will be cast entirely on moving it one way or the other. I'm sorry, I also don't necessarily want to. We have a lot of big decisions to make, yeah. and I also don't want to. If there's disagreement, or if there is, you know, if, if people have not all fully agreed on things, like I, um, I don't necessarily want to push out decisions on all on all of them. Okay, yeah, that was the So that was the only reason I was waiting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was, uh, I'm definitely not interested in avoiding. Decision making. Yeah, yeah. I was just, there are times where sometimes we feel compelled to decide yeah. on our weight. <laughs> and then upon reconsideration, it's like actually, why was it wasn't necessarily to bring me at that moment. Uh, and I have seen it out my oh. the last time I opened. Did you need this? Yeah, I think she has to. Okay. I'm trying to have this. First. Yes. Um, there are some people who um, we have not heard from, who I think maybe we should at least, uh, you know, people who over many years have been central in discussions of that subject. I, I would like to hear from them. And uh, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what her position is. Do we write her and ask her or call her? Talk about yeah. that. Okay, great. But, great. I mean, the committee should. Right. I'm just, I haven't heard anything from her yet. And so I don't know if you have. Um, okay. Yeah. So I'm happy to hear from other folks if you could just facilitate the conversation by reaching out. And, and the other is the extent. It's Danny. Yeah. Let's hear from Danny. So, Reggie. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, if you can reach out to Miss Smith, that'd be great. Thank you. All right. Um, so back to the document and team. Let's start from getting, we all have slag copies with questions. I think we made it to page 20. Um, we're not going to get very far without dealing with the fact that there's a uh, purpose section. And we talked about um, rewriting. I look at um, my to do list is supplying the language to you. So I owe you that. I don't know if others think it's a friend. But it would not leave it just an effort. Uh, um, this, the second one purpose that begins on page one is entirely oriented to 687. No surprise, because that's where it comes from. It doesn't address housing. So we have a bill that won't be in sync with all the work it does if we leave that in sync. What are we on? Um, so I think, let me just take a step back. We're going to stick with the ad path by the house document. Yeah, so what I submitted today is a strike is a strike all is 1.1 yeah. and it's highlighted in yellow are changes from what we discussed on Friday. Sorry, a small handful of things. Yeah. We're so, looking at little things that we might have put I in addition, what it does starting on page uh 133, uh it attaches the tax. And it, it happens the section of the 311 that I did not draft. Okay. So 61 through uh, section 100 are attached uh, and they're attached verbatim from 311. Okay. So I don't know if it makes sense. I'm assuming it makes sense to just stick with the as passed by the House version since that's what you all were supposed to mark up this weekend. Yes. And they are, I mean, make sure that I understand them. I was anticipating that the first one of the well, current very pages are the same as our, other than that yellow highlight. Yeah. They're the same as what we were walking through. Yes. Great. All right. So let's pick back up on the walkthrough for myself. Um, I want to follow up. Was that that's my to do view was on the 
the language that makes the purpose that they expand in scope of the bill. What's the you? Um, if we were to change the title of the bill at the end, also to include the need for housing, um, is that would that go here or at the end? At the end. Okay. Great. Something on my radar. <laughs> So that uh, would be one of those final sections where it shall be known as after, or you just do a section. It's a strict element, so it would be at the end, uh, and an unhawed passage the bill should be known as. So, so that goes at the end. Um, so on page 21, on Friday, the first 10 sections of the bill were walked through. Uh, I flag an open question for us back on um, page two. Um, if you do merging into page three, the, it is that structure of one full time plus four and a half time. I don't know where that. That originates in the house or yes. So you pass you pass this language multiple times. Yeah. Um halftime originally came about a few years ago when the governor had proposed three full-time board members. Uh uh and the house's conversations. And I think it's happened in here as well that three is maybe not enough people for this board. Five would have more conversations and uh, get around the limitation on uh, quorum. So five half time is equal to the same pay as three full time. And the concern that I expressed before and thought more about over the weekend was that we're asking them to do a lot of work. On Maps, standing ready for the right rules, getting ready to write rules. Um, um, and I would hate to see that group constrained in its capacity to get work done, especially because it's right at the center of making this whole transition possible. So let me, um, for the sake of discussion, just put out the idea that I'm wondering about having it be. Uh, Five full time. I'm also suspicious that the legislature's own reluctance to provide full staffing capacity. To we have seem to have a history of that. Okay, so let's leave it and be good to come back to it. But that is something in that must be yeah. So skip that all the way to point, right? Well, they have four full time. Oh, okay. Cool. Instead of the five part time, we have all full time. Well, that's what the idea I just was saying right out of the room. Oh, concerned Are about you having small. No, <laughs> uh, oh, not, not joking. So, the to do list section over seems substantial. And uh, if it's to save money, uh, I'd be concerned about overwhelming. But you don't have a decision on the appeals process? Um, no, I guess. So that's something I'm, if you don't like the idea, you can just say, <laughs> no, I would be in favor of the idea if we made a decision on the appeals process part, because that feels like a relevant piece of their work. Well, it would be. If we did that. So. I apologize, I went to the bathroom at the wrong time. <laughs> um, that's why they brought it up. Okay, so page 21. 
I guess so procedurally, let's just start walking forward from there and see if there are any questions or that it's clear that it's legal. Page 21, section 11, this is giving the board the authority to hear appeals of jurisdictional opinions. Those appeals are currently heard by the federal court. Uh, it's moving the same language from that statute into this statute. So you have to appeal within 30 days and then people have to get notice. Uh, there's, it's been, yeah, there's um, the effective date for this is when, or it's, it's um, not where it, I'm not seeing it in this, in this page specifically. Yeah, so like all the other appeals, the transition would happen in October 1, 26. Um, I, so with there being a lot of controversy about this, um, so we'll just, just so people know where I'm at with the appeals um, in general. Um, I definitely see the trade-off and I am not necessarily convinced that the um, Environmental Review Board is the right place for it. I do know that this um, was a situation for many years and then it transitioned away. Um, it seems like uh, there there were, there's, there have been some good points, both corrections. Um, but one of the things that I am, so so I this is the part where I'm like, it's, I can keep an open hand about that and understanding the, the arguments um, both ways, but I, I am concerned about uh, the transition to the um, environmental review board hearing appeals um, prior to the work of the tiers and uh, Maybe this. Oh, oh. Set. Right. And I mean, I think that's part of in the back of part of what I think. Yeah. yeah. There are a lot of things to do to be before you'd be doing. Right. So we are we um do we have a sort of a just a good sequencing of tasks is really the goal with saying it. I'm going to assume that was a rhetorical question. No, my question was no. <laughs> um, I, um, I don't think you asked me a question. No, well, I think it made sense. Um, but if, yeah, okay. I would at the, at the very least like to push the date back of that transition, which I realize is not quite exactly the year. In these pages. So they would take over appeals? Yeah. And yes. what can I ask? You, what year would the ERB take over the appeals process in this bill? October 2026. Okay. And then they would finish like the, they would finish all of their, yeah. Well, I guess most of it gets wrapped up in December at the end of 2026. So yeah, I guess there's a there's a little bit of overlap. There's a little bit of overlap. I, I'd be I'd be open to a delayed start of them hearing appeals until they wrap up what the new jurisdiction takes effect. So it would be January 1, 2027 would be the my so that's what the the only one lingering. Well, and is that when they're is that when it's enforceable at that point? Oh, you mean that when the tiers are being right, when whenever the tiers are enforceable, that should be um yes the soonest. Is the date that tier three jurisdiction takes effect technically that date? Like when it would be all enforceable? So Sort of. Well, simple. So the house did make a change that, okay, so the sequence thing is that the RPCs need to update their maps. In order for the tiers, tier one, to be granted and approved, 
it, the regional map for that area has to be approved. So the map will need to be approved before tier one is available. Tier, tier three, the other end of that spectrum, doesn't take effect until January 1, 2027. So they are to coincide. The House did add a provision that towns can start applying for tier 1A as soon as their regional map is done and approved, which could be before 2027. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. So yeah, there are parts that would be enforceable before if they really got their stuff together and did it all. But the last, like the drop date, essentially would be the twenty. And so it's all up and fully up and running. Twenty twenty six, January twenty twenty seven. This, and again, my preference would be to keep it with the courts, but uh, I'm I'm just one opinion here. But um, at the very least, uh, at least pushing out. Uh, is it is it logical to? Was the his logical question is a question for us, but um, one way we could structure it is that as the tiers are uh, enforceable, that, that there's a, a, a rolling, um, you know, that that any anything under the new scheme would be uh, appealed, the appeals would be heard by the um, BRB. Sure, so I'll just give you some information. Um, the appeals move to the board is a concept that has been, been prepared and worked on for the last five years and is separate from the tiers process and the separate policy proposals. They do work together because it is all related to the board having full oversight of the Act 50 program. So I don't think there is um, a need to have appeals of, of active 50 appeals, active 50 purpose, and the tiers happen together. I don't think they need to. I actually think the House's original plan was that the board should start hearing appeals so that they have experience with the active 50 program as they begin to develop this new location-based jurisdiction so that they are familiar with it and they're doing more work on the program as they begin to develop this other location-based jurisdiction system. The other thing I do want to flag is that they are going to need to review and approve all 11 regional plans in a fairly short period of time. So I don't think you want to happen, them to happen at the exact same date because then they will also have to start hearing appeals and fitting those in to their schedule where I think they'll probably be prioritizing getting all the regional plans done immediately. Would they be able to structure that, especially if they're a full-time board? Yeah, probably. I mean, they're going to just need to be having hearings on these things, but regional plans are like 300 pages or four, so they're, those are long documents um, that they're going to have to figure out. Um, but in regards to the what kind of work that the board would need to do to uh, get ready to hear appeals, they, would need, they need to adopt rules. Uh, the rules of the prior board are on the NRB's website. You can see what they were back when the board was up and running and what procedures they had. Um, and the board is to be appointed by 2025. So already there's 15 months built into them getting ready to start hearing appeals and to start getting ready to do the uh, regional maps and tier 1A. So I think for me, what I, I you know, be helpful we would hear from Reverend Bondar about the rather than when we can ask you to make a case for that sequencing. Uh, the thing I was wondering about is a little bit on and on, but I think what you're asking, which is if they're busy doing maps, for instance, and defining tier, are they would it be better for them to focus on that and then the appeals uh, work would follow after that? Here and mapping work is done. Um, and it might be that they say no way D fully capable of doing both at the same time. Um, hold on. Is that part of what's yes, yes, yeah, 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 that's how many things impressive. can you do well at once? Right. And does also in principle sort of the clean break if you're gonna move to a new um 
judging aggregations based on peers, you want them fully defined before, then you start your appeals based on that and we will teach location based language. So, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Generally, I'm in favor with as written. Uh, that's where I stand. I respect the conversation around the court um, and if they should maintain the role that they play as they do now. Um, I've spoken, I in fact held that opinion probably up until like Thursday of last week. Mm -hmm. um, but I have spent quite a bit of time thinking about it. And it seems like based off of the 50 year review and kind of the efficiencies that could be gained and the way that our, it, there's a lot of, I, I don't necessarily want to make a pitch for why um, because I don't think that's my job. Um, but I am supportive of the house's version and their plan um, that they've outlined in this bill. And I would be sad for us to not make a decision after the amount of work and effort that has gone into articulating the plan um, that is within this bill. And it would take a lot for me to feel that we would move in a different direction. Um, but I am open to a conversation about, uh, <laughs> I guess I'm open if you if you really feel that we can't, we don't need to make this decision now, I'm open to us not making that decision, but I, I haven't, I, I actually don't necessarily agree with that. I, I do actually think we should make a decision on this, uh, especially when projects that are being planned are usually like five plus years out. So people making decisions about projects now and developing projects now and thinking about what their community is gonna look like in five years do need to have decisions made now for their own for their own logic and how they're going to make decisions. Do you, you get what I'm saying? Like us waiting means that other people may not have information they need for their long range planning. So. Sure, and I, I don't know if those the opinion please uh, apply to the question of appeals. But in sort of a perfect world, there are no appeals. Yeah, and it seems like what I've heard from folks is that they, the market responds to what we do with Act 250, whether or not I think that that's a fair thing for them to do. Um, and so uh, I do think it will factor to people deciding the units that they put in. Can people plan on this? People plan on what they're going to do if there are groups. Yeah. You know, developer plans on the part of that. And also people who, as soon as they get wind of something that they don't find, they start beginning to think about posing it. So part of that will be what we do. We don't want that. Yeah. Um, in terms of the project pipeline, I mean, I honestly, I haven't heard anything that suggested to me either way, like, oh, we've been waiting, we've been uncertain enough that we wouldn't move our project forward until we can see its you know, appeals will go to the ERB, or uh, we won't move a project forward until we know for sure it, for the foreseeable future there'll be at the environmental division. Um, but you may have had different conversations. But that is intimated to me that developers would feel a certain way on both sides. <laughs> and I don't. I haven't heard someone say I will or won't do a project. I've heard we will make decisions about our projects based on the process. Generically, one of the generic complaints is uncertain. Yeah. Okay. Um. So how about if um, Representative Bonders is traveling up here today? Maybe um he can visit with the committee. I think you know it'd be good to hear from the house directly. About it. We haven't. We talked, he introduced the bill, but did the entire thing. We didn't really lean into that particular. Could we also have his email that he sent to us, but in his written testimony, if he's open to it? Sure. I, I'm, I suppose that uh, I'll double that, you know, I'll ask him if he may. Yeah, I mean, if he's open to it, it though. Record, it was very helpful. But he will also, I think, let's try to get him in the committee. Okay. Um, and when we break for lunch, I'll um, reach out to him. Uh, I'm not sure it's precisely where he is at the moment. 
I'd be heading for our committee by the time. He's on route. Yeah, Lieutenant Watson. Just for expediency, I'm wondering if we can just change the date from October 1st to December 1st. If it's, if it's and then it would at least line up. So. Okay, so we're looking at, uh, you're looking at that uh, summary. Yes, trying to make sure I'm looking at the same. There's more than one October one date. BRB issues rules procedure for permanent meals and jurisdiction transfers. So both, so they're both happening that same uh, date. And you're saying move over to the end of the year in order to disentangle it from the adoption of uh, RP, the regional planes. Mm -hmm. But that would directly entangle it with RPs. So, so that's, I mean, that's fine, <laughs> but just like, that's when, so the RBC plans have to be finished and then if they were submitted to the board right. at that, that, that same time. So you're saying that he's totally slammed. Yeah, January. I mean, I think there's intent that some of the RBCs will do it before that, mm -hmm. but they will not be, but, mm -hmm. but yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put a pin in this. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, there's a flag up. Whether that's helpful or not, um, so we have people in the room who will have opinions on that. Informed opinion. Okay. If you do. Um, why don't we? I don't want to people on an awkward spot, but we do have Mr. Baker, Mr. Gregory. Do you want to say anything about this discussion of maps moving to the, the board uh, and the timing? Uh, yeah, Charlie Baker on behalf of the RBCs. Just, yeah, we were looking at that end of December 26 as a final deadline, but also have been encouraging our peers to think about getting it done sooner so that they weren't, I mean, we're all going to get jammed up at 11 at the same time. So um, I don't know that we'll be able to actually spread them out, but um, we'll try to do that. And so do you think if, if we kept the date at October, um, First, then whoever got it done might be that might be a little bit more of a rolling um, opportunity to have review. Yes, yeah. Our number one is the different is for the permanent oh, appeals. All the permanent appeals. Sure. Yeah. Not the RC. Right. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Got you. So. Um, those are the permanent appeals. Uh, that would be coming through would be largely under existing law, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So we're putting a big pin in <laughs> section uh, 11 on page 21. Unless it's key marking. He just cleaned up this. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Oh, there's 22. It's so reassuring. But... <laughs> it's so reassuring. <laughs> yes. I mean, this is really annoying when you two look great. Right? That's why <laughs> I can't stand it. <laughs> All right. So, section 12. Section 12 is the permit fee, is the fee section $295. Yeah. Yep. Right. Um, I think on the table. Right. Oh. Now we're back in your field. Yeah. Um, yes. So section 13, which goes from page 23 all the way to page 33, moves the appeals from the court to the board. I'm sorry about the yeah, that's mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and say with second 14 mm -hmm. on page 33 to 34. I'm on vision. Yeah, sounds so, awesome. In three level, there was a requirement about the appeal that. Um, it was like 25 people or 3%. Oh, it was, oh, 
Problem 311, is that what would apply to these appeals that are just Okay, I'll say them up. But if we weren't allowed to include that, we would be putting your there. No. Oh. <laughs> okay, those are for municipal and BO. Municipal. So that'll be a separate conversation. Um, well, yeah, no, 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 no. I will discuss uh, people of particularized interests. Have we, maybe it happened years ago, right? did we do away with material in the system? Friends of the commission. Well, that's, still that's the same thing as a, they're still They're still right yes. Made it so tremendous. Yeah, same. They actually did do it. It used to be okay. part, full party status. It used to be oh, okay. to be able to be an appellant, you could be a material existing party. That's gone. It's all particularized interest. And then there's a joint, but like if you're a neighbor or RPC or a town, um, and particularized interest is standing. It's like we do the, it was the same time that the board was eliminated. There was a decision made to go to the court standing. So, no more materials with the parties. Friend of the court is like an amicus. You don't have full rights. You can participate, but you can't appeal. Um, we should think about the strong materialist parties. Right. So, um, 15, let's just be brief. Let's go through. Um, Bottom page 35, fourth block, and we so great for lunch every couple of hours. You know what I mean? Um, 15, 16. 15, uh, any comments about that? Who staff attorneys for time? This is where you would be going to get. Yeah, it's the fault. Well, we're in pin territory again, right? Because we've got the Environmental Review Board um, uh, carrying out on um, new task. So, are you, are you making a recommendation to change this section? No, no, it's just that it's. Uh, we're sort of running, we're running around the same question in different sections. And it's helpful to also pass over the basis of the night we're putting pin in 11, and also 14, uh, 15. Doesn't make much sense to me to. Try to sort out these states, for instance, where we're uncertain as to whether or not they're also taking other views. So, how about uh, we'll take out a break now? Um, it is five after 12, uh, 45 minutes, lunch break. Um, I'll reach out with Representative Bongards, the person that runs in the room, then we can hear. Um, the arguments that, or the pitch that dates all the way back to at least the 50 years report, but you were you were a part of that panel. Right? 